From a mother who would go to any lengths to gain full custody of her son, even if it meant killing her husband, to a young lady who shot a pregnant woman to death over a hair weave, to a woman who starved her young daughter to death, these defendants are about to face the consequences of their actions, and their reaction to the judgment will blow your mind. Julissa Thaler. At the sentencing hearing for convicted killer mom, Julissa Thaler. Julissa Thaler, a Spring Park woman, faced the ultimate judgment for a crime that shocked the community. On the night of May 19th, 2022, Thaler committed the unthinkable by shooting her six-year-old son, Eli Hart, nine times with a shotgun. The tragic event unfolded amidst a bitter custody dispute with Eli's father, Tori Hart. Concerns about Thaler's alleged drug use and deteriorating mental health had been raised, but despite these warnings, Dakota County Social Services returned Eli to her care. Thaler's crimes were discovered when the police found her driving a severely damaged car back to her apartment. After a stop and search, they found Eli's body wrapped in a blanket lying in the trunk alongside the murder weapon. The case quickly gained attention, and the community watched in horror as the details emerged. The police quickly built a strong case against Thala after they went through the surveillance camera of her apartment complex and were spotted leaving the building late at night with Eli. They also went through her web history, which revealed how she has been Googling how to murder Eli and the kind of insurance she could receive. On February 8th, a Hennepin County jury deliberated for less than two hours before finding Thaler guilty of both first and second degree murder. The mandatory life sentence for first degree murder in Minnesota meant that Thaler would spend the rest of her life in prison without the possibility of parole. In the courtroom, the atmosphere was heavy with grief and anger as victim impact statements were read. Eli's stepmother, Josephine Johnson, and his aunt, Nikita Kromberg, who had fostered Eli, shared their heart-wrenching memories and the devastating impact of his loss. Eli was an innocent, loving six-year-old boy. He did not deserve this. No one should ever have to feel this kind of pain or experience, this kind of trauma. But we have been sentenced to a lifetime of this pain, confusion, grief, sorrow, and trauma. Josephine spoke of the deep bond between Eli and his father, Tori Hart, describing how their love and connection were evident in every moment they spent together. She emphasized the irreplaceable void left by Eli's death and the enduring pain that would never fade. Tori Hart, unable to find the words, stood silently beside Josephine, offering his support as she broke down in tears. Nikita Kromberg spoke of Eli's life, describing him as more of a son than a nephew. She recounted how Eli was like a brother to her own children, six-year-old Reese and 12-year-old Jason. Go back in time and go visit Eli. Give him one last hug and kiss. One last, one last time of seeing that big toothless smile. One last time of hearing his giggles. One last time of saying goodnight, pumpkin. Eli's absence left a void that deeply affected her youngest son, who struggled to attend school without his cousin. Therapy helped him cope, and he now sees Eli as a butterfly, a symbol of transformation and hope. Eli will forever be missed by so many people that loved him. He will forever and always be in our hearts. Nikita expressed her guilt for not being able to save Eli lamenting her failure to document encounters with Thala, whom she referred to as a monster. Why would she kill Eli? If she didn't want him, she should have given him to Tori. Her emotional plea resonated with the courtroom, prompting Judge Jay Kwam to reassure her that it was not her fault. He commended her for making Eli's life better and urged her to cherish the time they had together. When given the chance to speak, Thaler shocked the courtroom with a profane outburst, declaring her innocence and insulting everyone present. Ms. Scholar, you have a right to speak this morning if you'd like. You don't have any obligation to speak, but if you'd like to choose to speak, now is the time to do it. Yes, I would like to say something. Go ahead. Um, I'm innocent. You all, you're garbage. 
Thala's reaction was described as one of the most disgusting things to ever be witnessed in a courtroom. Miss Thala, I you know, don't know that that's appropriate here. Um, Sorry, I told you what somebody else can. What I would say is, you know, the worst thing that seems to happen to parents is to lose their child. It's worse, though, when you don't lose your child to something like cancer or an accident. Judge Kwam admonished Thala, emphasizing the unimaginable pain of losing a child, especially at the hands of the one who brought them into the world. But what is, according to law, the just and fair sentence for what you did is what Mr. Aller said, and that is life in prison without the possibility of parole. So I will judge you guilty of first degree murder and issue that sentence. Judge Jay Kwam delivered the final blow, sentencing Julissa Thala to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Take a seat at the North County Superior Courthouse as we are about to witness how far this mother went to gain custody of her child, Diana Lovejoy. The gunman, lying in the sniper position, shoots six to seven more rounds. Diana Lovejoy and Greg Mulvihill were once a seemingly happy couple. However, by the summer of 2014, their marriage had crumbled, leading to a bitter divorce and a contentious custody battle over their young son. The tension between them was palpable, and the courtroom drama was only the beginning of a much darker tale. Diana Lovejoy, a fitness instructor and aspiring author, accused Greg of sexually abusing her and their son. These allegations were serious and initially led to supervised visitation for Greg. However, after a thorough investigation, the court found no evidence to support Diana's claims. The family court eventually granted Greg shared custody, much to Diana's dismay. As the legal battles raged on, Diana met Weldon McDavid Jr., a former Marine and gun instructor at an Oceanside gun range. McDavid, who later installed a security system in Diana's home, became more than just a professional acquaintance. Despite being married, McDavid and Diana engaged in an intimate relationship, and their bond grew stronger as they plotted a sinister plan. By the summer of 2016, Diana and Greg had reached a legal agreement to share custody of their son, and Diana was ordered to pay Greg $120,000. But Diana wasn't satisfied with this outcome. She wanted Greg out of the picture for good. On the night of September 1st, 2016, the plan was set into motion. McDavid, using a burner phone he instructed Diana to buy, called Greg and pretended to be a private investigator. He claimed to have evidence that Greg was abusive, which could be used against him in the divorce. McDavid lured Greg to a dark trail off Avenida Soledad near Rancho Santa Fe Road under the guise of handing over this supposed evidence. Greg, accompanied by his friend Jason Kovach, arrived at the location armed with a small baseball bat and a bicycle light. As they approached the designated spot, Greg shone his light around, searching for the evidence. That's when McDavid, dressed in camouflage and lying in the bushes, took aim with a long barrel gun and fired. The bullet struck Greg in the side, but he managed to survive. Kovach quickly called the emergency service. Uh, my friend hasn't been shot. The investigation into the attempted murder of Greg Mulvihill quickly unraveled the shocking details of the plot. Authorities discovered the burner phone used to lure Greg to the dark trail, and it didn't take long for them to trace it back to Weldon McDavid Jr. and Diana Lovejoy. The evidence against them was mounting, and both were arrested and charged with conspiracy to commit murder and attempted murder. During the trial, the prosecution painted a damning picture of Diana and McDavid's relationship and their sinister plan. Deputy District Attorney Jody Breton argued that Diana had manipulated McDavid with false tales of abuse, convincing him to eliminate Greg. The prosecution presented evidence of their intimate relationship and the meticulous planning that went into the attempted murder. Jason Kovach, who witnessed the ambush, took the stand to testify against Lovejoy, which further corroborated the prosecution's case. He shines the light around looking for things and that's where that's when I noticed you know something that looked like a gun sticking out of the out of the bushes. I just remember seeing someone laying prone on the ground um, with the, the the gun which I thought was a looked like a sniper rifle with a gun a silencer on it or something. McDavid took the stand in his defense claiming that there was no intent to kill. He testified that he only intended to shoot out the light in Greg's hand fearing that Greg had a gun. McDavid, an expert marksman and former Marine, insisted that if he had intended to kill, he could have easily done so. Marines are taught if they wanted to kill someone, two to the center, mass, one to the hip. He described the shooting as an accuracy error, a claim that the jury found hard to believe. I thought of my son growing up without a father. My father was killed 
My father was killed when I was 24, and I still haven't gotten over that. I would not take a father from a child. He said that Diana Lovejoy, on the other hand, did not testify during the trial. However, she made a tearful statement during her sentencing, insisting that she would never take her son's father away from him. I actually abused, and I did. I witnessed my son be molested once, and I did take all the steps I possibly could to ameliorate that situation. Lovejoy claimed that the trial testimony was untrue and that there was no murder-for-hire scheme. She tearfully insisted she would never harm the father of her child. I would never be able to do that. <laughs> it's so painful that people, some people in this world seem to think that I would have it in me to do this. Diana's defense team argued that she was a loving mother who had been caught in a web of lies and manipulation. Despite their claims, the jury was not convinced. They found both Diana and McDavid guilty of conspiracy to commit murder and attempted murder. The jury, in the above entitled cause, find the defendant, Diana Jean Lovejoy, guilty of the crime of conspiracy to commit murder in violation of Penal Code Section 182. The courtroom was filled with tension as the verdict was read. We, the jury, in the above entitled cause, find the defendant, Walden K. McDavid, to commit murder. Diana collapsed and had to be taken out on a stretcher, while McDavid put his head in his hands and cried. During the sentencing hearing, Diana broke down in tears, maintaining her innocence and insisting that she would never take her son's father away from him. She claimed that the trial testimony was untrue and that there was no intent to kill. However, the judge was unmoved by her emotional plea. He pointed out that there was sufficient evidence to support the verdict and that Diana had shown no accountability for her actions. McDavid also spoke during the sentencing, denying that a murder for hire scheme ever existed. He reiterated that he only intended to shoot out the light in Greg's hand, not to kill him. Despite his claims, the judge emphasized the gravity of his actions and the premeditated nature of the crime. While this mother was ready to do anything to gain custody of her child, this next woman killed two of her children and froze them for years. You! Everybody want to know yes, I did kill her! Michelle Blair. Blair's parental rights to her two surviving children and terminate the rights of both fathers. On the morning of March 24, 2015, an eviction crew from the 36th District Court arrived at a modest home on the east side of Detroit. The house belonged to 35-year-old Mitchell Blair, a mother of four who had been struggling financially and was being evicted for not paying rent. At first glance, the situation seemed like a routine eviction. Blair was not at home when the crew arrived, so they began the process of removing her belongings. As the crew moved through the house, they came across a white deep freezer in the living room. When they attempted to move it, they made a horrifying discovery that would shock everyone. Inside the freezer, wrapped in a large plastic bag, was the frozen body of a teenage girl. Beneath her, wrapped in a blanket, was another body, that of a young boy. The Wayne County Sheriff's Department was immediately called to the scene. The bodies were later identified as Stephen Gage Berry and Stoney Ann Blair, two of Mitchell Blair's children. How did you conceivably sleep at night? I slept well. Of course, at first I cried. It was f***ed up because I had to let go of all of that. The gruesome discovery left everyone in shock and disbelief. How could a mother commit such an unspeakable act? It was just an evil act. You had a number of other options open to you other than the extreme violence with which you decided to act. What do you mean accept it? You had a number of other options. There were no other options. I, I'm not playing crazy. I wasn't in depression, none of that, it's no excuse for rape. What do you mean, accept it? The bodies were taken to a morgue where they had to thaw for three days before an autopsy could be performed. The medical examiner ruled their deaths as homicides caused by blunt force trauma. Stephen had also suffered thermal injuries. It was determined that Stephen was killed in August 2012 at the age of nine, and Stoney was killed in May 2013 at the age of 13. Their bodies had been in the freezer for over two years, hidden away while Blair and her remaining children continued to live in the same house. It made me feel like I wasn't you turn around and you do that to my son, you knew exactly what she was doing to him. She knew exactly what the f she was doing to him. So yeah, she, man, I don't care what anybody thinks. She had the f 
go. The court proceedings for Mitchell Blair were as shocking as the crime itself. In June 2015, Blair stood before Judge Dana Hathaway at the Wayne County Circuit Court. The courtroom was packed with people eager to hear the details of this horrifying case. Blair's demeanor was cold and unremorseful as she recounted the events that led to the deaths of her children, Stephen Gage Berry and Stony Ann Blair. Blair confessed to the murders, claiming that she killed her children because they were sexually abusing her youngest son, a claim that has never been substantiated. What did you do to Stony Blair that makes you guilty of premeditated murder? She raped my son. I intentionally killed her. She described in chilling detail how she discovered her youngest son simulating sexual activity with toys in August 2012. When she questioned him, he allegedly told her that his nine-year-old brother Stephen had touched him inappropriately. Enraged, Blair confronted Stephen, who allegedly confessed to the abuse. Blair's reaction was brutal. She began torturing Stephen over a period of two weeks, starving him, making him drink Windex, and pouring scalding hot water on his genitals. She even suffocated him with a plastic bag and wrapped a belt around his neck, lifting him off the ground. Stephen succumbed to his injuries on August 30th, 2012. Blair wrapped his body in a blanket and hid him in the deep freezer. Nine months later, Blair claimed she discovered that her 13-year-old daughter, Stoney, was also abusing her youngest son. That she did that to him, but um, I repeatedly punched her on many occasions every time he told me what she did to him. Um, by assault, I mean I punched her I have put a bag over her head till she lost consciousness. Um, I threw hot water on her. She tortured Stoney in a similar manner, beating her with a two by four and suffocating her with a garbage bag until she lost consciousness. Blair later stated that while Stephen's death was an accident, she had meant to kill Stoney. You meant to kill her? I definitely meant to kill her. Okay. Wasn't an accident? No, not at all. If I had a chance to do it again, I would. She showed no remorse, referring to her children as demons and stating that she would kill them again if given the chance. Even during her custody hearing, the prosecutor speculated that Stoney's dad knew there was abuse. What happens when your kids come to visit you in 2005? Sister gave them a bath, seen whips on her back. Who's seen whips? My sister. Your sister. Did you see these whips? She showed them to me. Are these long red marks? No, they was healed up by the time I seen it. Blair fought Stoney's father in court for abandoning his kid and being a deadbeat father. Listen to me. This is a civil case. It's not a criminal case. We can and we will do I it did. without you. I never we tried will to say I didn't. I did it, but that does not negate the fact that they were never there for their children. I had to struggle with them all the time. They were never there. She wanted to keep custody of her remaining surviving kids. Prosecutor Karen Goldfarb stated that there was no evidence to support Blair's claims of sexual abuse. Mitchell's oldest child, Gabby, testified that there was no concrete evidence that either Stephen or Stoney had sexually assaulted their younger brother. Gabby described how their mother became obsessed with the notion of abuse and interrogated the youngest child until he said what she wanted to hear. In the end, Mitchell Blair pleaded guilty to one count of first-degree premeditated murder and one count of felony murder. She was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. And I find that just so sad in this case. Uh, after all is said and done, you imposed the death penalty on your own children. I did. And you readily admit it, and you want to take responsibility of it. You're therefore sentenced to the Michigan Department of Corrections for the rest of your life without the possibility of parole. As she was led away, her lack of remorse and chilling confessions left an indelible mark on everyone present in the courtroom. Gabby Blair, Mitchell's oldest child, and her younger brother were taken in by their great-aunt following their mother's conviction. The trauma they endured was unimaginable, and both children required extensive therapy to cope with the abuse and the loss of their siblings. Gabby recalled the constant fear she lived in, knowing that her mother was capable of such brutality. She described how she was repeatedly burned with a curling iron and beaten with a wooden plank. The presence of the freezer, where her siblings' bodies were hidden, was a constant reminder of the terror she faced daily. I was afraid to even walk by the freezer, Gabby said. Every time I came downstairs to eat breakfast or to play a video game, I had to walk right past the freezer, but there was nowhere else that my mom could hide. The bodies, they were cooped up in a freezer like meat. This next defendant is about to find out that patience is very profitable, Shelby Isaac.
On January 22, 2016, a horrifying crime took place in the 2100 block of Westchester Circle in Memphis. The victims, Eddie Tate II and Edwina Thomas, were found brutally shot. Edwina Thomas was pregnant at the time, making this a triple homicide. As the investigation progressed, Shelby Isaac emerged as a prime suspect. The 20-year-old woman was soon charged with first-degree murder for the deaths of Eddie Tate II, Edwina Thomas, and their unborn baby. Prosecutors argued that Isaac wanted her money back from a purchase of hair weaves, a dispute that escalated into a deadly confrontation. The trial of Shelby Isaac was a highly anticipated event, drawing significant media attention and public interest. The courtroom was packed with spectators, all eager to see justice served for the tragic deaths of Eddie Tate II, Edwina Thomas, and their unborn baby. Prosecutors laid out a compelling argument, detailing how a dispute over hair weaves led to the brutal killings. They presented evidence and called witnesses to the stand, including a key testimony from Victoria Say, a co-defendant in the case. CA's testimony was crucial, as she provided a first-hand account of the events leading up to the murders. Her statements vividly depicted the escalating conflict and Isaac's role in the tragic outcome. Throughout the trial, the courtroom was filled with emotional outbursts and dramatic moments. Judge James Lammy had to rule on several objections, maintaining order as the intense proceedings unfolded. The defense attempted to counter the prosecution's narrative, but the evidence and testimonies presented were overwhelming. The climax of the trial came when the jury delivered their verdict in November. Can you please stand? Count one of the count verdict to read, we the jury find the defendant guilty of second degree murder as included in count one. As the guilty verdict was read, Shelby Isaac collapsed and cried out, Mommy, a moment that captured the raw emotion of the case. Guilty of second degree murder as included in count one. Signed by the four person of the jury. Ms. Murphy, is that your verdict? Uh, Ms. Aldridge, is that your verdict? Ms. Foster, is that your verdict? Yes. And is that your verdict, ma'am? Is that your verdict, ma'am? She had to be taken away from the courtroom, a scene that left a lasting impression on everyone present. Isaac was found guilty of second-degree murder for the death of Eddie Tate II, reckless homicide for the death of Edwina Thomas, and criminally negligent homicide for the death of the unborn baby. The judge sentenced Isaac to 30 years in prison for the murders of Eddie Tate II, Edwina Thomas, and their unborn baby. Isaac sat quietly, her head dropping into her lap as she absorbed the weight of her punishment. This next defendant is about to find out that not every ideology is sensible, especially especially when it affects the quality of life of your family. Tatiana Fusari. He rolled over to face me and he started punching me in the face. Let's dive into the background of this tragic case. Tatiana Fusari and Seth Welch had a troubled history with Child Protective Services dating back to 2014. This was after THC was found in the system of their eldest newborn child. Despite this early warning sign, the couple continued to live in conditions that would later shock investigators. On August 2nd, 2018, their 10-month-old daughter, Mary Welch, died of malnutrition and dehydration in Solon Township, Kent County, Michigan. At the time of her death, Mary Mary weighed only eight pounds. The parents, aware of her severe underweight condition, refused to seek medical assistance, citing religious reasons and a deep mistrust of the medical system. Instead of seeking emergency medical help immediately, Fusari and Welch first consulted a lawyer, treating the situation as a mere formality. They then called 911 after getting cleared by their lawyers. How long ago did you find this child? Uh, it's about an hour and a half. I um, was waiting The dispatcher found this very strange as children who were the same age as Mary never slept for that long. And he said, when you found her, she was already believed to be deceased, right? Yes. And that's when you consulted with a lawyer? Yes. Do you believe she was beyond help already? Oh yeah, she has given a bad as a the initial investigation into Mary's death revealed horrifying conditions in the family home. The county sheriff testified that the house was unhygienic, with evidence of vermin, insects, and mold. The doctor who performed the autopsy stated that Mary was suffering from chronic malnutrition, which he believed was caused by the withholding of food and water. Following Mary's death, Child Protective Services sought to terminate the parental rights of both Tatiana and Seth. The legal proceedings began swiftly after the tragic death of Mary Welch. On August 2018, Tatiana 
Tatiana Fusari and Seth Welch were both charged with felony murder. The charges were shocking, but their reaction to the charges was what truly captured the public's attention. Both charged with what they call felony murder, while in the perpetration or attempted perpetration of child abuse in the first degree, they're alleging that you murdered one Mary Welch. That is a charge called homicide felony murder. It is life without parole. It requires a DNA sample to be taken upon arrest. As the charges were read out in court, a video captured the couple's stunned and disbelieving faces. The footage quickly went viral, spreading across social media and news outlets. In the video, Tatiana and Seth appeared visibly shocked, with Tatiana breaking down in tears and Seth looking bewildered. Their reactions seemed to underscore the gravity of the situation and the severe consequences they were facing. As the case progressed, more disturbing details emerged. In 2021, Tatiana Fuzari took the stand and testified about the abuse she suffered at the hands of her husband, Seth Welch. She claimed that Seth would rape and beat her and that she was not permitted to take their daughter, Mary, to a doctor. He got very angry with me. He smacked me across the face and he told me that he knows how I... He said, you know what the f I think about doctors. I told you Mary is fine. She's f***ing fine, now drop it. Tatiana blamed this abuse for her inability to provide proper care for Mary, stating that she did not notice her daughter's deteriorating health and did not know what caused her death. I didn't think there was anything wrong with her. Despite her testimony, the court found Tatiana guilty. On November 2021, she was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole for first-degree murder. The judge also handed down an additional sentence of 15 to 30 years for first-degree child abuse. The courtroom was tense as the verdict was read, with Tatiana breaking down in tears, her face a mix of disbelief and sorrow. Click on one of these cards on the screen to see more content like this.